this is the time of year where um, we end up, you know, buying presents and collecting those gifts for um, people, and we want to keep them as a surprise, so we'll oftentimes find ways to hide them and put them in those secret places. Well, I remember when I was a kid, you know, mom would go shopping, and, and then she would come home, and she would say this really odd thing. She would say, I don't want you to go snooping around in my closet. Now, that was an odd statement to me, because in the previous 10 months, she had never mentioned her closet to me before. I had never had the inclination to go, now, I wonder what their closet looks like. I know what my closet looks like. I wonder if they have, like, this magical closet to be able to... I never, it never dawned on me that I ought to go look at my mom and dad's closet and see what their clothes look like hanging in the closet. It never dawned. But when my mom said, don't you go snooping in my closet, I went, huh, that might be a great place to go snooping. <laughs> and so inevitably, you know, mom would make the mistake of leaving us home for a few minutes by ourselves, or she would be off doing something, and the opportunity presented itself, and so snooping into the closet, one would go. I, I couldn't help it. I don't know what it is about it, but it just was so enticing that I couldn't avoid snooping in the closet just when I was told not to. Um, and it was really nice because occasionally you'd find a great Christmas present that you'd pull out and play with and then put back in the box or there's it's just, you just, I, there's something about us, right? When we're told don't do something, there's something that our, we go, hmm, all of a sudden that is the most exciting thing I've ever thought of in the world. I, I never in my wildest dreams would have thought to do that, but since I can't do it, Hmm, man, I think I'm going to put all of my... It just There's something inside of us that has a tendency to want to do that. Well, we want to look at that today and see what Paul has to say in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. And we're going to look at what Paul, how he kind of carries this line of thinking through and, and where we get to see the beauty of Emmanuel with us. And so our first point today, if you're following along on the worship guide or you're following along on the app or you're following on online, the first point today is the law and sin. Boom, boom. That'd make a great TV show. Boom, boom, boom. Anyway, Romans chapter 7. We're going to pick up Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 12. And here's what Paul says to us in Romans 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? Now, we're jumping into the middle of a largely, deeply theological argument that Paul is making about who Jesus is and the work of Christ and that we are sinners saved by grace and we're kind of jumping into the midst of this. But one of the tenets that Paul has made is that the law is no longer necessary and that the law brings up this reality of sin and if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't have known there was sin. So we're kind of jumping into the middle, and I encourage you, if you just want to spend some time, go read the book of Romans and kind of get the whole context. But we're jumping into the middle of a train of thought. And he says, what shall we say then? Shall that the law is sin? Since I wouldn't have known sin had the law. And by no means, Paul says. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known that it, what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. We begin to invent ways to be covetous. For apart from the law, sin lies dead, dormant. I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. 
So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. There's a, there's a part of me, and I'm sure there's a part of you, that responds negatively to commands. As a child, when I was told don't do something, all of a sudden it became incredibly enticing. Don't touch the cake. Ooh, <laughs> just got to get a little... Right? There's something about the negative, the don't do, that causes me to just sort of, ooh, I want to do that now. When I'm told no, there's a part of me that rebels, that pulls away that wants to go do what I've just been told no. And this, this reality of the command, or the commandments, or the laws of God, are the very things that when we find them, when we discover them, it causes us, because of sin, to want to go and rebel against those things. Paul uses this example of covetousness. He goes, there was, it was before the law, there was covetousness. It, it, it existed. Coveting existed. I just didn't know it was called coveting. I imagine, I'm, I'm adding some imagination here, so this is not in the Scriptures. I imagine that Paul would have said, before the law said don't covet, I considered that, mm, you know, having ambition. It was, I was just being ambitious. And I was really kind of pursuing things. And I really wanted to do. And, and then all of a sudden the law comes in and says, hey, that actually is coveting. That's not ambition. That's not drive. That's coveting. And then I go, whoa, well, if that's coveting, I can figure out all different kind of ways to do this. I, I, let's bring it to a New Testament, New Testament context. Remember Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount? And he, he pulls the law up, and he says, you know, the law says don't murder. And everyone's like, well, yeah, we shouldn't murder. And then Jesus says, but I am going to tell you that if you hate someone in your heart, it's just as bad as murder. Because the holiness of the law and the goodness of the law is more than just my action. It even goes to the very intent of the heart. Sin that lives within us, the sin nature, this, this part of, of our flesh, this part of who we are as human beings, this sin nature is part of us. It, and when we find ourselves confronted with the law, confronted with righteousness, confronted with holiness, confronted with goodness. It sneaks up on us to assault us. It likes to take us captive. It wants to deceive us. And when we're told no, when we see the righteousness of good life living, sin says we don't want to do that, we want to rebel against it. And it will come up with all kinds of ways to deceive us, we are good at deceiving ourselves. The law of God gives a command. Our sin nature is activated. Our sin nature goes, woo. And in it, it produces an opposition. It says, if that's what God wants, I want us to do this. If God says go that direction, I'd rather go that direction. Sin wells up within us when we hear the holiness and the righteousness and the goodness of God. Sin goes, I don't want to do that. The law serves as a lens that changes our perspective on what's happening around us. And the perspective gained from the law reveals that what had seemed to be normal, neutral behavior or activity was in fact sinister in its origins. What I, what I thought was just being attaboys and going after it and being ambitious and trying to do what's good for me and my family, whatever it may be, when the law of the mirror of God's righteousness is reflected to us, we begin to see all of a sudden, well, maybe that's really not. Maybe that's actually a sinister behavior. Sin. It wells up within us. God's law is perfect. God's law is holy. God's law is righteous. God's law is good. But it spawns in us, because of sin, it spawns within us the desire to do the opposite. Sin responds rebelliously to the good, holy, righteous nature of who God is. And against this holy, good commandment, 
He, sin deceives us. It draws us away. It entices us to do that which is contrary to what God has said. The sin that dwells within us. We are trapped by this sin nature. How can we escape? How can we get away from it? How can we overcome it? How can we get, ab- get by without dealing with or having to, to address the sin that seems to show up all over the place? How do we get freedom from this death? How do we escape this reality? How can we overcome? Well, the reality is that we are fatally flawed. We're fatally flawed. In and of ourselves, we are incapable. If you continue Romans chapter 7, verse 14, verse 14 and 20 says this, If we know the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not want to do what I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So no longer, so, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I, I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want is what keeps what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. We are fatally flawed. We are flawed. We can't escape it. I know I shouldn't do that, but I can't help it. I do it anyway. I know I shouldn't watch this. I can't help it. I do it anyway. I know I shouldn't say this. I know it. I, I want to do this thing right. I want it. And I keep finding myself failing. Here's the reality. Your willpower is not capable of pulling you out of this tension. Your willpower is not strong enough to overcome the reality of sinful flesh. I want to do right, but I just can't seem to do it. Sometimes, hey, today I did good, but tomorrow, yesterday, I, but right now, I could do this. I could just, oh, I could. I want to do what is right, but for some reason, I can't seem to make it happen. We are fatally flawed. No matter how hard I try, no matter how many guardrails I put up, no matter how many um, um, uh, um, friends I put in place, no matter how many accountability partners I have, no matter how whatever you put it, no matter, I am fatally flawed. I, no matter how hard I, no matter how hard you try to do what is right, sin that dwells within us, it breaks its head up and it jumps at us and it begins to entice us and draw and go, hey, but this looks pretty good, doesn't it? We struggle with these two opposing laws. The law of the Spirit that says you don't have to do this. And the law of the flesh that says I can't help but do this. And we struggle to be a good Christian. What do we do? How do we overcome this reality? I've tried it. I've done the self-helps. I've got the accountabilities. I've done this. I've done that. I've done all the things that everybody tells me I'm supposed to. How do we do it? Are we helpless? Are we hopeless? Are we stuck in this misery of sin and sinful nature and the inability to overcome the consequence and the reality of sin? Are we just stuck? Paul says, I am am wretched in this reality. A wretched person that you are. What is there? To, how do we overcome this? How much strength do I have? How much ability do I have to overcome the power of sin in my life? We are hopeless, or are we? Is there a solution? How can we as human beings born under sin in the flesh overcome the power of sin? You 
can't. But we have this wonderful reality and Emmanuel has come. Emmanuel has come. God is with us. Emmanuel has come. Look at chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. We could, you could stop right there for a moment. If you have ever dealt with, if you are a believer in Christ, and you have placed your faith and trust in Christ, and you struggle with things of your past, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation because we have Christ who dwells within us. Look at this. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. What has he set you free from? He has set us free from the law of sin and of death. How has he done this? Verse 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The flesh, which is filled with manner of sin, it is a, we have a sin nature. We're born that way. And when the law says, don't do this thing, the flesh goes, ooh, I'm going to do it. And then it goes to war against you. What God has done, what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. And how did he do that? Emmanuel, by sending his own son, God with us, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh they set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit they set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to the laws of God. Indeed, it can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Emmanuel has come. God is with us. But not only has he come, God has made it possible for us to be out from under this bondage of sin and slave to death. God's incarnate Son Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to escape the consequence of death, the consequence of sin. Jesus took on himself the form of sinful flesh. Do not say that he took on sinful flesh. He took on the form of sinful flesh. He looked like you and I. He was a human being. He, was a, he had flesh and bone. He grew up as a boy. He stubbed his toe. He pounded his finger with a hammer when he was making something in the carpentry class. Right? Uh, he, he, he learned to speak. He was potty trained. Uh, he grew up as a boy. Climbed the trees. I don't know what every boy is doing. Ancient Israel did. He did it. He was, he was a man. He was a human. He was in flesh. He developed relationships and friendships. He had buddies and pals. He was God with us in the flesh. He was in flesh, but he did not have sinful nature, which allowed him to do what only God can do. He came, verse 3, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. The Bible says he set his eye to the cross. Because it is only through the payment of sin, through death, with by one who is righteous and holy, that sin's debt could be paid. But what does that do for you and me? See, you and I are sinful. We're born sinners. Right? That's, it's, it's our nature. We struggle with these realities. But Christ came and He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And in doing so, He gave us something that we can enjoy and participate in. He gave us His life. He gave us the ability to no longer be bound 
to sin, no longer to be under the bondage of death. He gave us life. Paul, Paul uses three words in this, these verses, recurring, right? And he even kind of attaches a little bit of his own, length, his own definition to a couple of them. But the first one is the word flesh. Flesh is that human nature in all of its weakness, is how Paul references it. This human nature in all of its weakness. And if you were to look at Galatians chapter 5, Paul really kind of gives us an idea of what this weakness of the flesh is. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. This is the evidence of the flesh. But living according to the flesh is a life living that is dominated by these characteristics. It's dictated by the desires of human nature. And you and I are born in the flesh. And the sin that, that wants to pull us away is driven by these realities. But Jesus was in the flesh, and he was able to condemn sin in the flesh. Destroying its power and its ability to take us captive. Because of the work of Christ, sin no longer has the power to do what sin wants to do. The power of the flesh and the power of sin has been overcome. If we are in Him, and we believe in Christ, and we have taken on His righteousness because of the work of Christ in our life, the power of sin has been weakened, it has been destroyed, it has been overcome. I do not have to live a life described as one who lives after the flesh. I get the ability to live a life that, like, that is like Him. I don't have to succumb to the pressures of sin and the flesh today. I don't have to. Because I have the Spirit that dwells within, which is the second word that Paul really drives into, the Spirit. The Spirit that Paul uses and he refers to it, it's, it's this idea of the power of the divine. It's the same word that you see back in Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering this is the same concept. This, this, when Paul uses this idea of, of the Spirit, he's not talking about some, you know, some ghost thing. He's talking about the power of God in the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. The law of the Spirit is life. We are now able to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And we're able to do that because of Emmanuel. God is with us. He has come, he lived, he died, he was buried, he rose again so that you and I were no longer required or obligated or bound or, or taken captive by the laws of sin, but instead we had the ability to live by the Spirit because the Spirit dwells within us. Paul, Paul highlights this in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. How does the evidence of the Spirit? is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There, I don't know if you realize that, right? There's no law that says, don't be peaceful. Don't be patient. There, there's no law because the fruit of the Spirit brings these things out in our lives. And those who belong to Christ, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is calling us and reminding us that the flesh that we're stuck in, it's temporary, but we have victory. And the victory that we have is in the power of the working of the divine, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who gives us the ability to walk in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. The, the third word that Paul 
harps on in this, in this passage is the word mind. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. The mind of the spirit or the mind of the flesh. Let this mind. And this is the idea. It's a way of thinking. Right? It's an aspiration. It's an aim. Let this mind be in you. And the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here, here's, here's the reality. When you wake up in the morning, what is your mind fixed on? When you have interactions and encounter with others, what is your mind fixed on? When you, when you engage with conversations or you're being tempted or tested, tested, when you're being tempted in a direction that you know you have weakness in, what is your mind set on? See, our mind is an powerfully important piece of this because it helps provide us with some direction and volition. It is our aim. It is our goal. It is our objective. It is the thing that I'm going to focus on. Are, we, are you reading the Scriptures? Right? Romans 12, renewing our mind. How do we renew our mind? By being in the Word. What, what is your mind set on? We have the ability to live a life that is free from a life of sin and depravity because of the wonderful work of Emmanuel. And God dwells with us. We're no longer under the bondage of sin. We're no longer under the, the, the holding power of sin. We have the ability to live a life filled with the power of the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead has the power to live within you and compel you. How do we trust God? and place our faith in Christ. Set your mind on the Spirit and not on the flesh. For those who are on the flesh, they cannot please God. So if I, if I wanted to highlight, if there's one thought I wanted you to leave today with, I want you to kind of leave with this thought, this sermon in ascendance, if you would. Emmanuel, has removed the penalty of the past and provides divine strength for the future. Emmanuel, God with us, because of the work on the Christ, Jesus has removed the penalty of the past. And in doing so, He has provided strength for the future. I don't, I don't know how your past, what your past is filled with. I'm not talking about 5, 10, 15 year past, which may be part. I'm talking about yesterday past. I'm talking about this morning past. I don't know what your past is filled with. I don't know what kind of struggles you've had. But I, I'm here to declare to you today, if you are in Christ, the past has no condemnation on you. You have been forgiven. You've, the sin, the flesh has died. And when we were buried and rose with him through baptism, we rise again and we declare that I am in Christ and the power of God through the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And so as you leave today, your future is bright. Because not only have you been forgiven of sin, but you have been given the ability through the work of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is reflecting and honoring of the work that he has done in your heart and life. We have strength for tomorrow. Let me back up and recant that statement. We have strength for today. Let's not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Let's worry about today. God has given us the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit for today. Set your mind on the Spirit, not on the flesh, because of the work of Emmanuel. The divine strength for the future is now. I, I don't know what God is challenging in your hearts today as, you, as we've read through the Scriptures today, but I, I hope that you are ready to take a next step, that you're ready to acknowledge what God is doing in your heart and your life and respond accordingly. May, maybe you would be in the room today and you say, you know, I'm kind of like those first two like, I'm dealing and struggling with sin. I don't have this victory thing you're talking about. 
Like, I don't know what that's about. Like, I just deal with sin. I know I shouldn't be doing this stuff. I do it anyway, and I don't even know. Maybe you would say today, I want to commit my life to Jesus. That Emmanuel with us can be with you. Maybe you would say today, I commit to make Jesus the Lord of my life and my Savior. So that you can live under the power of the Spirit. Or maybe you'd say, I'm struggling with sin of the flesh and I need help in prayer. Look, if you are struggling with sin in your life and with things happening in your life and you're struggling, we want to partner with you and help you. Let us know. We would love to come alongside you and encourage you and pray with you and help you and guide and just facilitate, be a part of your life. Or maybe you'd say, I rejoice today in the life and peace that I have in Christ Jesus. I rest in that reality. Praise the Lord if you do. Praise the Lord.